Welcome, everyone. I'm happy that this room is this full. I'm glad because, you know, they're going to talk about, as far as I'm concerned, important stepping stones of getting us to Mars. Now, I have the pleasure to introduce Sam Samimi, and Sam knows Sam Samimi is for me, Mr. ISS. And as director ISS, I suppose that he's not just Mr. ISS, just for me. Without him, perhaps no 90 minutes long loops around Earth 400 kilometers over our heads. But without him, certainly, the year-long Mars Fact finding mission on ISS by Scott Kelly and Michael Kornienko would not be as when Explore Mars put the question out, can the International Space Station be used to train for human missions to Mars? Sam was quick to respond with a resounding yes and set out to convince others of this idea. Sam and his panel will lead us over the stepping stones, including ISS to Mars. And Sam, please introduce your panel. tag around. I don't know. How did you do that, Artemis? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I got it. I got it. It's working. It's working. All right. All right. So th um, thanks, uh, Artemis. And it's good to be here in this uh, particular room again. This was a room where we initially kicked off the 40 Mars activity a couple of years ago. Harley, was it? Yes. Two years ago. Uh, two. Two, two years ago. So it's great to be back in this uh, intimate, uh, <laughs> this intimate environment. Uh, the panel we're going to uh, start with today is uh, the first of two related panels. Uh, the panel we'll have here today uh, is we're going to talk about how we're utilizing space station or could be utilizing space station to um, get humans out of low Earth orbit and onto uh, cislunar space and onto Mars. And in the second panel, uh, my esteemed colleague uh, Skip Hatfield uh, will uh, follow up that with our uh, next steps so, uh, that we'd like to be able to take uh, beyond uh, low Earth orbit. So uh, that's the first thing we're going to talk about uh, today. And I'd like to first to uh, introduce uh, the panel that we have here. First is Robin Gatins. Um, she's my acting deputy here at headquarters. Um, she comes originally from Marshall. She's worked at uh, ECLIS systems and the like and in, on station and in Orion for many years. And she's been here at headquarters now for, what, two years now? All right. Uh, next is Bill uh, Pelosky. He is the, the manager of NASA's Human Research Program down there at JSC. Um, he uh, comes from the uh, University of Houston, and you were there till what? Uh, you've been there since 2008, or that's right, that's right. And has been a professor of uh, health and human performance. Uh, next is Mike Gold. Uh, many of you guys know Mike. He's been around for quite some time from. <laughs> from Bigelow. Uh, he's responsible for a broad range of activities um, at Bigelow, including international uh, business development, legal issues, congressional affairs, strategic planning, and anything Mr. Bigelow wants him to do, basically. Uh, then, then we have uh, Mr. Bob Richards. Uh, Bob is from Orbital ATK, uh, and his, his field is the human spaceflight business development area, and including all the things that's going on with Space Station and the CRS and of that nature. But before we get to the primary topic, um, I want to discuss a little bit about communication. And I got a short video here that, that may resonate with the folks here in the room, and then we'll go from there. Am I doing this right? The forward button mean forward? Young space cadet? I may be a rebel. All set, your hero ship, sir. Then make way for Duck Dodgers in the 24th and a half century! Oops! <laughs> Had the silly thing in reverse. And now then, eager young space cadet. Here is the course we shall pursue to find Planet X. Starting from where we are, we go 33,600 turbo miles due up. Then west in an astro arc deviation to here. Then following the great circle, seven radial loops south by down east. By astro astrobo to here. 
this earlier here today and here. Yesterday. Then by space navigal compass to here, here, and then to here, and here. By 13 point straddle cumulus bearing 4 million light years, and thus to our destination. Now, do you know how to reach Planet X? Uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, oh, sure. Well, I wish you'd explain it to me sometime, Buster. Uh, well, 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 it's very simple, sir. If we follow in the, in the, in those planets, we can't very well miss Planet X. <laughs> oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> of all the stupid suggestions. <laughs> hey. All right, so... <laughs> Uh, I, I uh, played this at uh, HEO All Hands we had, and, and it really resonates us in trying to communicate what we're trying to do. Uh, we do a lot of talking amongst our own community about what's obvious to us, uh, and that's what uh, Daffy Duck was doing. It was obvious to him how to do it, but had no way of communicating, and, uh, but the, por uh, it's that Porky Pig? Yes. Uh, is, you know, he's, he communicates the obvious. So when we communicate about what we're trying to do, we need to think about how other people see us and how we should communicate to them, them not what's obvious to us. And I'm going to do a case in point here, do a little bit of self-criticism. i get the next slide. This is NASA's main page for the International Space Station. And maybe some of you have visited this. We have a lot of good information on, on this this web page about what's going on in HRP and the one-year crew and all the research that we're doing. But what's missing in here is a story. There's no story here. You can't get out of this web page or anywhere on this web page through all its links on why we have the space station, uh, what we're doing to advance humans beyond low Earth orbit, what we're doing for the commercial development of low Earth, low Earth orbit. Those kinds of things, you won't find a story. You find a lot of interesting facts and figures and news about space station but you won't find a story so we as a community and I'm looking at you know myself and our own organization and you guys out there is that the way we communicate um, has, a, has a lot to be desired especially with our stakeholders and um, with the general public so given that I want to talk about uh, where we are with with space station uh, many of you have heard me talk about this before we're basically car camping in space Everything that we need is very close by, and we're just a short, short Soyuz ride away if we need anything. Going to the next slide. Specifically, we have all these, I don't think that works for that, but being an old ops guy, I'm prepared. Uh, we're just two days transit time going to up to the space station and back, so we're very close for anything that we need, especially for any kind of emergency crew return. Our communications is all near real time. We have uh, crew exchanges every six months, and maybe you know we'll get to crew exchanges every year. We have crew supplies and, and logistics that come up. We have crew and atmospheric samples that come down. Another e uh, element of being close to, to, to Earth is that all our crew blood, urine, all our air samples and, things, and water samples all come down to Earth to be analyzed. When we go to Mars, we're not going to have that ability to bring all those samples back. We'll have to do it on board. Um, we have modified hardware that is able to come back up to space station once we've flown it back down, repaired it, figured out what was wrong, and sent it back up. We won't have those abilities on, on the way to Mars. We'll have to be able to troubleshoot, and the only spares we're going to have is the spares that we've got with us. I mentioned uh, emergency crew, crew return. And one unique thing for space station being in low Earth orbit, we've got a great way of getting rid of trash. And going to Mars, trash will be one of the big problems that we have to solve uh, uh, to, to be able to be able to uh, not crowd ourselves out of the, out of the, the vehicle that we're living in. So going on to the next slide. So what, so going to Mars, you know, it's Earth independent. You know, we're th that crew is going to be basically have to be self-sufficient, all alone basically. Um, they'll have communication. Going to the next slide. <coughs> The only thing they'll have is, is connection to the Earth is, is uh, c communication, which can be delayed up to 42 minutes uh, round trip. So all those neat things we had here close to Earth in low Earth orbit, we do not have at all in going to Mars. And, and to think about and the way we discuss things is how do we go from where we are today in low Earth orbit with all these connections to the Earth and being inside the Van Allen belts and the like to this kind where there are no connections other than a delayed comm link. So if I could get the next slide. 
And, to, and for the panel today, we'll hear about how we close that gap. You know, we've seen a lot of presentations today on how to, about how to get to Mars. Well, if you've heard, no one really knows how we're gonna actually get there. But what I do know is where it starts. It starts today and it has, it's been going on on the space station that, that we have now. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to Robin. It's hard to see. <laughs> um, all right. So I'm going to get into kind of an overview of use of space station as a stepping stone to Mars. And then I think other members of the panel will get into a few more areas uh, a little more in detail. I want to give you a little bit of a broad brush of how we uh, have planned to use and are using the space station to prepare us for Mars. Go into the next slide. I think it's working now. Oh, so I can do it. Where do I point? Ah, you've probably seen this graphic about 42 times now. Um, so just to lead in uh, with the Earth Reliant, um, with the ISS, that's, that's what we're talking about today. We are in the Earth Reliant stage. We're transitioning to the Proving Ground. And I maintain ISS as part of the Proving Ground. Um, it, we are Earth Reliant on, right now, but we're trying to transition the way we use ISS and things we do on ISS uh, to use it as a Proving Ground. And Sam and I share slides. So I stole this one from him. Um, this is really what he just talked about, uh, comparing the differences between uh, how, we, how we are uh, tied to the Earth right now with the station and how we have to untie ourselves as we go to Mars. So a couple of years ago, uh, the NRC did a study, and uh, we, we took the results of the, that study and did our own. And we started looking a little more in detail at uh, what are the things, what are all the gaps uh, that need to be closed in order to uh, get us to Mars? And of those gaps, which ones can ISS help us close? And so this is a, a color-coded graphic showing kind of the results of our study compared with what the NRC said. And there's some good alignment in, some, in a lot of these areas. And we looked at uh, technologies and capabilities uh, kinds of gaps, so systems and uh, things of that nature. Human health, what do we need to do uh, to enable humans to go longer durations in deep space? And then operationally, what do we need to do to enable how we do operations today versus how we're going to have to do operations in the future? Um, the color code is, uh, if it's green, that area we felt like could be fully enabled by ISS. There are things we can, we can and should do using, for example, environmental control and life support systems, which is my background. ISS is a perfect test bed. We've got a permanent crew. Uh, we can test our technologies, our loop closure, our, our system, make our systems more reliable for a couple of years and be confident that we can take those systems then into deep space. Um, some of the areas that are highlighted as yellow were considered to be, there's some things we can use station for, but cannot fully close those gaps using station. Um, for example, um, re-entry systems. We could do some things using station, uh, and, and we are looking at uh, put, uh, putting devices on our um, cargo vehicles as they re-enter, for example. Um, and then there's a couple of areas that we really can't do much at all with ISS. Those are indicated as white. For example, nuclear propulsion. I don't think I'm going to get Sam to OK an experiment on that on ISS. But as you can tell from this, this slide, there are many, many areas. So we formulated a plan. Um, and we're working to that plan to how try to, to close all these gaps um, using the station uh, while we have station. Uh, over the next 10 years or so. So I'm just going to highlight a few of the areas. I don't want to steal Bill's thunder, uh, but in the area of human health, uh, what's going on today? Uh, we've got 
uh, a lot of studies uh, bind down risks in, uh, for long duration human health. Some examples are depicted on the slide. There's um, bone loss prevention and how exercise uh, can mitigate that. Um, what are the effects of radiation? Uh, it's hard to see in that picture, but the yellow square is actually what's well, blown up here, a radiation monitor that we're flying on station today. It's about the size of a thumb drive um, uh, to, to monitor the cruise exposure to radiation. Um, a lot of work going on right now on the effects of microgravity on um, intracranial pressure, which is um, an effect that we've been seeing on orbit with some of our crews that affects uh, vision in some of them. Uh, so ocular health, doing some studies on that. Um, nutrition and food studies. There's the veggie system that's up on station right now, trying to figure out how we grow food in space, supply our crews with some fresh food for long duration missions. And then just looking at our food system, how do we keep food stable for a long duration mission? And then various medical kits and devices uh, that we'll need for a long journey as well. Of course, everybody's heard of, we have the, the one-year crew mission, and that's a big, uh, big uh, effort, initiative using station uh, right now with Kelly and Kornienko. And then we have the, whoops, the twin study um, with uh, Mark Kelly, uh, Scott's twin, on the ground uh, comparing uh, effects um, with two twins on microgravity versus uh, non-microgravity on systems. So this is just a little bit more about the one-year mission. Um, the longest mission uh, ever for U.S. astronaut. And then the twin study. And there's a lot more information on that on the uh, website with the link below. Uh, getting into some of the things we're doing for technology development. Uh, we've got our life support systems on board station today. And right now we've got our water loop is about 90% closed between the urine processor and water processor. We do throw away some water in the form of um, the urine brine that we'd like to see if we can recover. Plus our system uses a lot of filters and things that we would like to reduce expendables on as we go forward. <clears throat> We'd also like to improve reliability of our systems. Uh, there depicted is, is an example of an improved pump that we're considering for our urine processor assembly, which has been one area that has been less reliable than we would have liked. Our air system is about 50% closed right now, and we're looking at technologies to increase that loop closure, get the rest of that oxygen back out of carbon dioxide for future missions. Um, so we'll be making improvements to the EQLIS system uh, going forward and testing those on station. Um, I'm pretty sure you're going to hear about the Bigelow expandable module, so I won't go into a lot of detail on that. <laughs> That's an example of uh, <laughs> lightweight structures and materials going up soon. Uh, fire safety, uh, we're doing, um, uh, we've been doing a lot of studies on flames and how they behave in microgravity, but they've always been pretty small scale. We're going to have an opportunity coming up uh, to do, uh, using the Cygnus spacecraft after it's completed its mission, to light a large fire and study how a large fire behaves in space. Um, so that's going to give us a lot of good information. Uh, all you pyros out there, <laughs> be excited about that. Um, and then we want, we're developing um, improved fire safety equipment that we want to use across the architecture, such as one mask that the crew grabs no matter what's going on, a, uh, a fire extinguisher that doesn't asphyxiate the crew in a small cabin um, and is non-toxic, so um, a smoke eater if we have a fire event that can clean up smoke. We want to develop all of these things and then test them um, in subsequent um, missions. Robotic refueling with our uh, robotic refueling missions are about to get started with phase two on orbit. Uh, right now. In space manufacturing, you probably heard a lot about our 3D printer um, that's up and, and, um, and creating tools and other things. And we're looking at more uh, as we go forward whether we can print spare parts uh, to use in our systems. 
uh, down lower right. Um, that's a hard picture to see, but that's an, uh, our atmosphere quality monitor. It's an onboard environmental monitor that at monitors, as, as Sam said, right now we take grab samples and we return those to the earth. Uh, we need to be able to do all our monitoring on board. And so we've got some technologies. This is one. Uh, we're going to be flying some more to, um, to see what's the best thing, instrument or set of instruments to use uh, for uh, environmental monitoring. There's a, um, going up on, I think it's SpaceX 10, there's an experiment called ZBOT, Zero Boil Off of Cryogenic Fluid. This is looking at fundamentals of cryogenic fluid and trying to limit uh, boil off, which is a big limitation for using cryopropulsion. And then um, for our communication, uh, laser comm is, um, is the direction we want to go in the future. We've got an experiment on board called OPALS. It's a first uh, laser communication, and we're hoping to expand upon that. These are just some of the areas that are, are near term. We've got a lot more things planned to fly uh, in subsequent years on station. And finally, I was just going to hit on this a little bit. Um, we're working on transitioning from uh, complete government-funded presence in low Earth orbit to more of a commercial presence in low Earth orbit. And how does that help us go to Mars? Well, it helps us because as we can uh, develop commercial market in low Earth orbit, and then it kind of frees up resources uh, that we're spending right now um, with the government being the only um, supplier of low Earth orbit services to we can purchase just those services we want and we can leave a thriving low Earth orbit market behind and we can focus our attention on what we need to do to go to Mars. So I wanted to throw that in there uh, as a thought jogger as well. And that's it. That's all I had. Thanks. We're going to take questions after all of After all of it. Dr. Bill? Oh, oh sorry. Sorry. And um, what was on that? I thought I was going last. Yeah, you are going last. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> my mistake. My mistake. I thought it was on the session. Bob. 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 Yes, right. <laughs> First tense. Yeah, and you didn't do so well, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm pleased to be here to give you an update on uh, orbital ATK as well as give you sort of the orbital ATK perspective on uh, exploration and where we see things going from a stepping stones ISS uh, perspective. Start with the first slide here. Which direction is the forward? Could you advance it? There we go. All right. the uh, The point of this uh, chart, because I think uh, you know everybody's up on current events that we've gone through a merger with ATK, but is to emphasize the change in scale and uh, the bringing together capabilities that, that we think are going to be very useful for future uh, exploration. Uh, you know, throughout this presentation, I'm going to highlight our primary product that is in this area, which is the Cygnus spacecraft. You've already heard a little bit about it when it's going to carry in the future this fire safety experiment that, was, that uh, Robin was just uh, talking about. But I think uh, more than, than the Cygnus, uh, Orbital ATK is all about taking a commercial approach to, uh, to exploration. Did we decide this was working or not? There we go. Okay, so um, the, the new company has three main uh, operating groups, and those are really just shown to give you a kind of big picture of the capability that the uh, new company uh, has, both uh, in terms of space launch vehicles, missile defense on the far left, uh, uh, core defense systems, uh, armament systems, uh, smart weapons, et cetera, in the middle. And then probably the most relevant group, which is the space systems group, which is what I'm in, uh, which is a grouping of all things space, anything that starts out in orbit from commercial uh, satellites, scientific satellites, 
the Cygnus uh, vehicle there uh, on the upper uh, row, national security, uh, et cetera, et cetera. It's a grouping all in one place where we can get maximum synergy from uh, subsystems, systems, and apply them uh, to the future. And that application is uh, with the overall thought of how can we do this on a service basis, how can we apply commercial practices, et cetera, which we think have, have been borne out uh, fairly successfully. In fact, I wanted to start you know, further back to um, say, well, what, what has space commercialization been all about? Um, certainly in the uh, earliest days of the space program, the government provided detailed specifications and detailed oversight on how um, a product was supposed to be created and how it was supposed to be operated. But um, there's been, um, uh, really, since uh, 84, growth, uh, slow but sure, in a lot of different products which were uh, developed under commercial practices. And, uh, you know, I go all the way back to the beginning of uh, uh, Orbital Sciences, which was created to, to uh, support and develop products for commercial space. But we weren't the only ones uh, out there. You know, uh, Deke Slayton, famous astronaut, started Space Services. And uh, there's been forays into uh, cargo that went up on the space shuttle uh, with uh, space services. Uh, well, I, I was thinking of Space Hab really there, but the predecessor and, and uh, there was some overlap there of space industries, which wanted to create its own commercial uh, industrial facility or, uh, or a space station. And then, of course, the really uh, true commercial uh, product that's out there now is the, is the geocom. Uh, satellites, which uh, Orbital builds a certain class on the smaller end of those uh, satellites and has been a very successful uh, product for Orbital ATK. The other thing to uh, uh, think about is uh, the lessons learned out of the COTS program, the CRS program, and I think both within industry and uh, the government, it's thought to be a very successful uh, uh, program. Um, it, COTS started out as a Space Act agreement. It was uh, to de demonstrate a new way of doing business where there would be co-development of a uh, product that was of interest to private industry and of interest to, uh, to the government, primary interest to the uh, government. And it was a service-based uh, approach where both industry provided investment, the government provided investment, worked together for a common goal. and. Um, uh, you know, we believe, uh, and I think everyone else uh, agrees, it was a very successful program. This was followed by a service-based uh, uh, operational program called CRS. And uh, uh, when you look at the, the outcome of the combination of those two programs, over a six-year period, two new spacecraft and two new launch vehicles were designed, tested, and flown to the International Space Station with both uh, SpaceX and uh, Orbital ATK. So it's... Um, really a, uh, uh, I think, a huge success and an example of where you'll see a lot of uh, this model used in the future. We've already heard earlier in the, um, in the conference about fuel depots, and you, know, you could apply the same uh, model to fuel depots. You could apply the same model to uh, logistics going to beyond low Earth orbit station. Uh, it, it really uh, fits um, in, a, um, you know, in a good way. Um, also, to kind of uh, give you an update on uh, uh, our next uh, CRS mission. You know, one of the things that this approach does is it gives uh, some, something so important as cargo to the International Space Station some additional robustness by having two different uh, vendors involved in the uh, uh, cargo transportation. And as everyone knows, last October we had a launch failure and uh, we're now uh, recovering from that. But, you know, again, commercial industry can recover very quickly. For example, in our case, the Cygnus vehicle, uh, which was not at all implicated in the uh, failure, was designed to be interoperable with multiple launch vehicles. And within 20 days, we had secured another uh, launch vehicle on our own uh, funding uh, to keep the cargo going to International Space Station. That was an Atlas V. And uh, like I said, it was, uh, the whole industry really kind of pulled together. That was all done within a very short period of time, approximately a month. 
And that mission will be in November of this year. And then Antares, which had the uh, launch failure, will be first quarter of 2016. So we should have two uh, Cygnuses winging its way to the International Space Station, you know, by uh, the missions completed by uh, this time next year. All right, so one of the things is to always uh, pay attention to uh, the boss, and this is uh, Mr. Gerstenmeier's uh, chart, actually. And, you know, we, uh, we very much respect what NASA has uh, put together as uh, sustainable principles, and I thought it was important to, uh, you know, just throw it up here, um, it, not to go through bullet by bullet, because uh, it, I think it's been used several times already. But uh, certainly, uh, third bullet, uh, from the bottom, the use of commercial business to further enhance the um, the overall ISS logistics and crew market. You know, we we agree with that uh, wholeheartedly. You know, we like the last bullet: s substantial international and commercial participation, leveraging uh, current station partners. You know, we've tried to establish industrial relationships that kind of mirror. This is uh, with uh, foreign companies that mirror some of the relationships that NASA has with other um, uh, other foreign space agencies, and that's, that's worked out uh, very well as well. So where are we headed uh, for the future? Um, you know, we, we again really uh, believe that the commercial approach is uh, where uh, the future should go. We applaud the uh, commercial crew. We applaud all of the uh, s sort of smaller um, activities for expanded utilization. We're working very closely uh, with uh, CASIS and uh, with other uh, people associated with the National Lab. You know, we're going to hear about the uh, BEAM module, but we think that's, a, that's a, a great idea. Pretty much everything on the list there, CubeSat uh, deployments and how to how to take the model that's been established for for low Earth orbit and exp expand it to uh, farther out uh, uh, destinations, and that that really is uh, the focus of a lot of our thinking uh, right now. We're doing that in concert with other parts of our company that support the SLS uh, very uh, uh, very uh, firmly, and so we're trying to make sure that whatever we do is is uh, compatible with the uh, the SLS and uh, overall I think we feel like there's uh, a bright future there and you know you might even see something like this where derivatives of uh, Cygnus could be put together I mean you know this is obviously very uh, notional but um, the hardware exists it's very extendable it can be um, manufactured in a lot of different uh, uh, sizes, you know, links. Um, a lot of the uh, avionics is designed for ra high radiation environments, et cetera, et cetera. I can, I can go on, and that's not to say that the vehicle as designed right now is, would work, you know, just perfectly in lunar orbit, but it wouldn't have to change very much to uh, do that. So we think that things like this will be stepping stones in hardware development that are going to lead to the uh, future. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Bob. As you notice, folks standing in the hall, you might want to mention there are seats available. Larry, there are seats available. Oh, it's Larry. Never mind, Larry. No, down in front, front over here. All right. All right, Mike, you're up. seat available right over there as well if anyone wants a temporary position. Thank you so much, Sam, for the invite. Uh, to Harley Thronson for putting all of this together. Uh, for Bob for the kind words. Let me tell you, Bob believed in commercial space before commercial space was cool. You know, I remember you know, some hard work back in the day. So my name is Mike Gold. I'm with Bigelow Aerospace. Let me apologize to probably at least a third of you that could give this presentation. So feel free to sing along as we hit parts, I guess. Uh, let's go to the next slide, please. Oh, oh, I got my clicker. 
All right, I got the control. Dangerous. All right, so uh, first, you know, for the few people who aren't familiar with Bigelow Aerospace, you know, not that in this room there would be that many, but I think there is actually a misperception in some quarters that the beam is the first time that we've launched, and that is not actually the case. Bigelow Aerospace has launched two spacecraft, Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, in 2006 and 2007, respectively. You know, ironically enough, the idea of expandable habitats was initially developed under the Space Exploration Initiative. Who's old enough to remember that back in the day? SEI, right? We were going to Moon, Mars, and beyond. Well, actually, that was another program. We're going to Mars. <laughs> NASA needed a way to get a lot of volume up into space, but didn't have a lot of rocket fairing space, needed protection against radiation, physical debris, and they came up with the idea of an expandable habitat. But NASA hadn't done a lot of engineering, and that's why when the program was shut down back in about 2000, uh, NASA had the idea of expandables, but really hadn't built anything, which is why Bigelow Aerospace, when we picked up that torch, had to walk before we could run, and we developed a series of subscale prototypes, which was the Genesis program, to prove and validate the basics of the technology. I mean, there were those at the agency, and frankly, some within the company, that didn't even think an expandable could survive the launch environment, much less function in space, so it was very important to do these demonstrations. When I say subscale spacecraft, they weren't small by any means. Genesis 1 was about 10 feet in length, uh, about 6 feet in diameter, fully deployed. And Genesis 1 and 2 tipped the scales at about 3,000 pounds apiece. The company that launched Genesis 1 and 2 was ISC Kosmotros, a joint Russian-Ukrainian outfit, taking the old SS-18, designated Satan by NATO, removing the warhead, this is an old Soviet ICBM, taking the warhead off, putting on a commercial fairing, and then using the systems for commercial space launch. Literally a swords into plowshares effort. And just to make my life with the ITAR more interesting, we launched from an active Russian nuclear missile base in Siberia, which is why I don't complain about the weather here in DC at any point. <laughs> And let me just say, I'm glad that we did these launches in uh, 2006 and 2007, because could you imagine doing a joint Russian-Ukrainian project right now? It wouldn't have been good. So uh, the Russians did an excellent job with Genesis 1. Uh, you can see the spacecraft here. The way we get these images are there are cameras on the tips of the solar arrays on the forward and aft. Um, in its pack configuration, the Genesis spacecraft looks almost like a pen, and then when it expands out, it's actually the diameter that expands, and it turns into something that looks more akin to a Coke can. Uh, as you can see, the spacecraft you know, remains pristine, and you know we had thought that uh, there would at least be some leak rate. Uh, the leak rate has been in the noise, and our engineers only estimate that this thing could stay fully pressurized for 20 or 30 years without you know, any issue relative to the integrity of the system. And actually, the leak rate was less in orbit than it was during terrestrial testing in Vegas, which is a phenomenon that our engineers predicted, but boy, you never believe it until it's up there. So Genesis 1 was a great success. You know, if anything, a little too much of a success because you only learn from problems, and there weren't exactly a lot. We were hoping for a debris strike. Uh, the Chinese almost accommodated us, but didn't quite get there in the end. Uh, Genesis 1 was followed by Genesis 2. This is the recording of the launch of Genesis 2. There it goes. There it goes. Wow. As you can see, you know, the rocket pushes up uh, due to pressurized air out of the silo, and then it ignites. And if you're the crazy attorney who was pushing this whole Russian idea, that moment when it drops, scary, scary moment, especially when you're self-insuring. We like to say at Big Layer Space, reducing the world's nuclear arsenal one rocket at a time. So. Two down, couple to go. Just about reaching speed of sound. Yeah. There it goes. You know, uh, the Russians got us to within 300 meters of our desired orbital injection point with Genesis 1. With Genesis 2, they got us to within 100 meters of our desired orbital injection point. So, tremendous accuracy. But you know, I guess it is a nuclear weapon, so it has to be accurate. Or actually, it's a nuclear weapon, so maybe it doesn't. So, who knows? <laughs> Uh, this is one of the first high-resolution images we got down from Genesis 2. And again, both the Genesis 1 and 2 missions did a lot to prove out the technology. Due to the success of Genesis 1, we did more relative to internal subsystems with Genesis 2, tripled the amount of sensors for everything from visual cameras to radiation, magnetism, etc. cetera. Uh, we even had a reaction wheel on Genesis 2 that we did not have on Genesis 1. So very successful programs with Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, one quick launch anecdote. So we got back from Moscow like midnight on a Thursday. 
Uh, then Friday morning, my wife's throwing up, take her to the doctor, find out she's pregnant with this little guy. You know, nine months later, we have him. And proud father, uh, proud father, he's not even 12 hours old in these pictures. And I'm sending out pictures to all my friends, including the Russians. Two days later, the Russians send me back this shot. <laughs> so it's Photoshop, right? It's not real. But my father-in-law came bursting into the hospital room saying, how can you put my grandson in a metal collar? He's going to break his neck. <laughs> And all of my friends at JSC said, how can you put you know, a baby in a spacesuit? What kind of animals were they at Russ Cosmos that they were even thinking of an infant space program? And I said, nothing to dissuade JSC, that wasn't the case. So our next step will be the most challenging, and this will also be our most challenging PowerPoint slide. So if you've got a cursor, am I dating myself on the cursor thing or the pointer? If you can bring it down to the bottom of the screen, that's how you will activate this animation. There you go, very good. So uh, the beam will launch on SpaceX 8, which will go up in September. Sure. Yeah, so that's the beam. We'll go up on SpaceX 8. As you see there, it will be in the trunk or the unpressurized pallet of the Dragon. The arm will remove the beam and attach it to the aft port of node 3 where, you know, I thought the inflation process would take hours, but apparently a couple of seconds were done. So, you know, hopefully it goes all that smoothly. Uh, again, we're very excited about the BEAM program that even though it isn't the first time that Bigelow Aerospace is launched, it is the first time that we will ever have a Bigelow system attached to a crewed system, a crewed space station. And that's a big moment, not only for us, but for the technology, that for the first time uh, an astronaut, and I think it will be Scott Kelly more than likely, Yep, will be the one to go inside. Uh, we've also been talking to our friends at JAXA, uh, who I believe want to send an astronaut inside as well, potentially. So we're you know, looking forward to that as well. And this will be yet another stepping stone to full-scale operations, uh, which will be the B-330. But for the moment on the ISS, as we talk about utilizing the ISS to support exploration, you know, we believe that the beam is case in point. You know, a great way to use the ISS as a platform to demonstrate innovative, affordable, you know, low-cost commercial technology, that it can provide the proof of concept for different ideas. You know, Gerst mentioned this a couple of times, and I really appreciate the point that ISS wasn't set up to do commercial work. This is not necessarily the location where we're going to do robust private sector microgravity manufacturing. What we do want to do is develop the proof of concept so that there's a market for that in the private sector, and ISS can be a critical catalyst to making that happen, and we appreciate the work that the ISS program and everyone at NASA has done to try and make ISS that tinder that can set off the fire of commercial development in LEO, uh, and as you've heard throughout the day, you know, long-term exploration simulations, just like we're doing with Scott Kelly now, it's a vital platform to be able to conduct those sorts of activities. Bigelow Aerospace's next step is the B-330, as the name indicates, 330 cubic meters of usable volume. Uh, each of these habitats can support a crew of up to six. And while B-330 can operate as an independent station, we hope to pair them together to increase capacity and safety and overall utility. And this would be our alpha station configuration, which are two B-330s together in low Earth orbit, hopefully providing that platform for commercial LEO activity that can both complement and eventually succeed the ISS. In terms of moving beyond low Earth orbit, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, that was actually what our technology was originally developed to do. And believe you me, we are eager to take it full circle. Again, expandables provide much more volume than you get with a traditional metallic structure. The radiation protection, this was actually critical for the Mars program back under SEI, that while NASA liked the additional volume, they loved the protection against radiation, which as we all know is absolutely critical for these sorts of long-term exploration missions. The reason you get that with expandable systems is if you have a metallic structure, you hit it with solar flares, et cetera, you actually get a pretty nasty secondary radiation effect where the metallic structure itself gets excited, almost the same principle you have with your microwave. With an expandable, since it's primarily a non-metallic structure, you substantially reduce that effect. And this additional protection against radiation is something that we'll be demonstrating with the beam. Also, counterintuitively, everyone wants to say, it's an expandable, it's a balloon, don't bring your scissors, it's going to pop, oh no. Absolutely the opposite is the case. Uh, the analogy I like to use is if you're about to get shot, would you rather have some aluminum in front of you or a Kevlar vest? 
I vote for the Kevlar vest. And a Kevlar-like weave is exactly what Bigelow Aerospace utilizes. Uh, JSC was kind enough to lend us some of the ISS's MMOD, micrometeorite orbital debris layers. And we've done side-by-side -side hypervelocity impact testing with the Bigelow Aerospace MMOD. We actually offer superior protection to what we have on the ISS today. Uh, the structure also gives you better protection against trace contaminants because of the additional volume, less mass, and hey, what's more threatening than radiation and orbital debris? Budget cuts, right? Less money, so you can implement the system for a fraction of the cost. And while our current plans are to utilize the B-330s in orbital situations in LEO or as transit, you know, with Orion, um, you can also use them for surface applications. And as you see below, there's a utilization of the B-330 to support uh, surface applications on the moon. You could do the same thing for Mars. So we are looking forward to the launch in September and continuing our partnership with NASA. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thanks Mike. OK, so now you're up. <laughs> Okay, so I'm um, sorry for not being on the program. I was a late ad. And I'm going to talk about something completely different now about the human problems of trying to go to Mars. Um, the, uh, let me switch to the next chart. Okay, so I usually don't read charts, but I'm going to read this one because otherwise you won't. Human travelers to Mars will experience unprecedented physiological, environmental, and psychosocial challenges that could lead to some significant health and performance decrement in the absence of efficient mitigation strategies. Success of any human mission to Mars will hinge on the mission designers, everybody else on this panel, develop and implementing stra the, the, the mitigation strategies. The job of human research program, my job, is to identify what those strategies are. Okay, so that's a, a simple way of looking at it. When you look at, at Mars missions, um, and, and getting between here and Mars with other uh, exploration uh, class missions beyond low Earth orbit, the challenges to the human are much greater, much increased from what our experience has been, not only during the, uh, the, the lunar uh, missions, which were fairly short uh, forays outside of the low Earth orbit, but also beyond the, the, uh, the long duration low Earth orbit missions that we've had. When you look at the hazards to humans uh, in any space endeavor, uh, they include these, these, these five uh, different areas which are more or less independent of one another. One is altered gravity fields. That includes not only the microgravity during transit, but also the, the hypogravity on the surface, uh, and also the launch and loading lands and the G transitions between going into zero G and coming back from zero G. They include isolation, confinement, altered light dark cycles. They include the hostile closed environment they include increased radiation, and they include the distance from Earth, which Sam alluded to a little bit earlier. Each of these sets of hazards uh, affects different bodily systems. They're listed down there. I'm not going to go through them all, but our, our altered gravity fields will affect bone, muscle, cardiovascular, and sensory motor. Also have secondary effects on the immune system, what kind of nutrition you have to provide, how, how you perform from a human factor standpoint, and how you implement clinical medicine. So all these things are part of the, the, the charge for my program. Uh, and I should note at the very bottom that the, the uh, effect severity of any of these hazards increases with, with the, the exposure duration. So you'll see a lot of charts that uh, I went uh, in, the, in the NASA chart bin and pulled out like so many of my other colleagues. I've modified a lot of them to show something about how we're stepping forward with mitigating human risks uh, uh, in, our, in our stepping stone approach. So um, the first and most obvious is, is, is ISS. We're getting an awful lot of information from ISS. Robin talked about it, uh, Sam alluded to it, um, and I'm gonna, I have a couple of charts coming up that will talk about the details of it. The next step as we go into the proving ground, uh, we're expecting to get a lot more information from Orion, not necessarily from the small capsule that we have today, the taxi, but from Orion missions that will be in the cislunar orbit that we're thinking about with the outpost in cislunar orbit that might give us exposure to up to one year uh, in cislunar orbit with, with crew members. Uh, so that's in the staging ground. That will, that will expand our understanding and be a very good stepping stone for humans going from one year inside of low Earth orbit to one year uh, with some of the challenges beyond low Earth orbit. We're already, um, and have been for some time, 
relying on orbiters and landers that have scientific payloads, uh, SMD sponsors many of these. But in order to understand what's the toxicity of the Martian regolith, what might that do if you if 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 somebody if some pig pen traipses that into the into the habitat, is that going to be good for your lungs? Is it going to be good for your liver? Is it going to be good for your brain? Um, by getting early information about what what the content of that of that regolith is, if we understand how how much mitigation we have to provide to to, to do uh, to to taking care of those problems. Also, what's the radiation protection? What's the radiation environment in deep space? We spent a lot of time thinking about this, and just just recently had a very uh, long discussion with the NAC a whole afternoon on what we know and what we don't know about radiation environments in deep space for Mars missions. Um, and then finally, um, the the work we do will define uh, many of the of the uh, requirements for the deep space vehicles that carry people and the habitats that go there. So what the rest of these folks are doing will be driven in part by the by the requirements that we put forward to radiation shielding, radiation protection, how you lay out the the, the, the vehicle inside, right? So you know, imagine going for three years um, with three other people, three other of your, of your workers, your coworkers from your office, you don't get to choose which three. Your, your boss gets to choose which three. And now you're in three years in a Winnebago uh, with those three people. How are you going to get along? How are you going to make sure that you cope OK? Um, this, these are some of the issues that we have to, to deal with with the Human Research Program. Um, so uh, as I mentioned, our primary space platform these days is the ISS. Looking at uh, the fidelity of that for deep space missions, altered gravity fields, it's pretty good. Isolation and confinement, it's pretty good. But you know, crew members all have cell phones. They can call their family whenever they want. When you're at Mars, 42 minutes uh, uh, one-way communication, it's going to be hard to talk to your family. Uh, altered light dark cycles, we do pretty good. Hostile closed environments. Increased radiation, uh, metza, metza on that one. We're, you know, we're inside the Van Allen belt uh, still, so we get a pretty good protection from not only the, the solar particle events, but also from galactic cosmic rays. And distance from Earth, we're only, we can get home if something goes, if something goes south. Um, if you go to, to, to Mars with a chemical rocket, even if you're just outside a low Earth orbit and you burn, if something goes wrong after your burn, you're going to be there for 30 months before you get back. So it's not going to be a two-day. Uh, so whatever things we think we can take care of from a medical perspective, we need to provide that in the vehicle so that we can take care of it. And we have to figure out how we're going to teach people who are not physicians to take care of the other people. Um, and the other people to take care of the physician, because Murphy says the physician's the one that's going to get sick, right? Or that's going to get injured. OK, so what are we doing? You, you saw this chart or a version of this chart that Robin showed. A um, lot of hoopla these days about one year mission and the twin study. There are other reasons for doing this. There are actually some very important reasons for doing this. Um, this is the first time, if you think about, again, one of these thousand day missions, if you think about three years of mission, OK, our exposure so far is six months. Okay, that's how much time we have in space. Now we're going to one year. We get about a third of the way there. Now, the ancient mariners used to talk about uh, here be dragons, right? At least that's the myth, right? That, that the maps would show unexplored places. That's where the dragons would be. In this, in this range from, from, from one year out to three years, be there dragons. Are there, are there, are there boogie people out there? Are there, are there dragons out there? We don't think so, but we, we didn't think that we had this, this problem with intracranial pressure until we got to three-month missions or to six-month missions regularly. So there might be something out there by going to one year and getting more exposure to space flight at one year. There's a lot we can learn. But the first one is just a demonstration. It's two people. It's, two, it's an N of two. To get statistically significant results, we have to have about five more. We have to have an N of about 12 altogether, 10 to 12. So we're working with the Russians to try and, and define a program that they'll be follow on one-year missions. Now, the Russians, of course, want to do it a little differently. They want to do six months up, two months down in an isolation chamber, and four months back up to actually simulate a deep space mission. There's some nice things about doing that, um, but it doesn't get us our N of 12. So we would have to have a different N of 12 in order to make it statistically significant. Um, the twins, um, serendipitous, um, when uh, when Scott was selected, he said, hey, I've got a twin brother. Is there anything we can do with, with, with him? Um, and we started thinking about it at first. We thought, no, this is just a stunt. And then we started realizing, you know what? There is a, a revolution out in clinical medicine for the use of omics technologies, genomics, metabolomics, proteomics, and 
precision medicine is, is, is something that's just around the corner. In fact, in many areas, we're seeing precision medicine starting to work its way into the medical centers. By looking at these two twins with the team we've, we, we've, we've assembled, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a U.S. Uh, 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 Hall of Fame for folks who are doing omics re research that have gotten involved, people who would never get involved with NASA before because it's an opportunity to look at a very specific set of stressors going into space and, and what we know about the, the stress of low Earth orbit and comparing identical people that have basically the same genome, uh, one going into space and one, and one staying out. The one, the, the difference at the end of the day, uh, at the end of this mission, Scott will have 540 days of space flight accrued. His brother will have 54. So there's a whole order of magnitude in how much space flight exposure they've had. Other than that, they've had pretty similar careers through, uh, uh, throughout their, their lives. So this is a very important uh, 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 pair of, 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 of objectives for the station. Another thing we're doing um, is developing the right kinds of hardware. Um, if you can, the, on the lower left picture, there's an embedded video. You, you saw Robin show the, the ARED device. I don't know if anybody ever saw the ARED being used in space. This is how we provide resistive exercise in space. This device is bigger than my car. It weighs more and breaks down more often. So <laughs> we're, we're in the process. Yeah. <laughs> Um, we, we're in the process of defining how, how are we going to do the same thing, provide the same kind of loading with a smaller print, footprint, lower mass power volume um, uh, in the future. And we have three uh, candidates. There's actually, uh, there, there are some other candidates that are just for Orion that are even smaller than this. Uh, but we're in the process of, of testing those things. Uh, if any of these things are successful, we may be able to use them to replace the ARED uh, because it's starting to have uh, uh, aging problems. Um, okay, let me, let me move on. So, um, cis-lunar orbit, I mentioned before, for me, it's a very important place to go to validate uh, what's going on. If you look at my list of hazards, every one of the hazards that we're concerned about uh, is positive here. It's a much better simulation than, than low Earth orbit, uh, especially for the deep space radiation and other things. So, if we can get people in that orbit for long periods of time, you know, a 21-day mission isn't going to tell us much, especially about radiation. But if we can get them out there for a year, um, then we're going to learn a lot more about the challenges of, uh, uh, of, of the deep space missions. It'll get us that much closer to understanding, give us that much more confidence in what we know about, about how people deal with these things. Space radiation comes up all the time. Um, the radiation, as I mentioned before, in low Earth orbit is, is pretty much protected by the, uh, uh, by the geomagnetic uh, field. It's not fully protected. It, you know, these crew members are still at, at risk. Um, GCR are, are somewhat um, um, uh, uh, removed. I think it's down to 25 to 40 percent, depending on the species. Uh, solar particle events uh, and coronal mass uh, ejections are still there. We're actually not concerned about solar problems, about uh, those two things, because we know how to shield, whether we use the, these nice systems that, uh, um, uh, that are coming from Bigelow or other systems, we know how to shield those. It's the GCR that really are, are, are going to be a problem. These are big honking particles that are moving really fast. And when they go through your body, they tear things up, especially DNA strands. So these are, and, and when you try to shield them, they create secondaries that are worse than the shielding. So it's, it's probably going to be that we have to understand either how to select people right or how to identify that people are developing problems during the mission and being able to treat during the mission or have some radio protected countermeasures that we bring forward. Um, we can't really test these things in low Earth orbit, so we test them on the ground. We have a very uh, expansive facility at Brookhaven National Laboratory where we can generate all the species that are shown up in the upper right, and we can actually create uh, galactic cosmic ray-like environments that we can put uh, experimental animals uh, in front of. We have uh, three campaigns a year we, we sponsor about $35 million worth of research, uh, most of it from the uh, extramural community uh, each year in, in trying to uh, uh, understand these effects on people. Um, so uh, just to, to end, um, the way that we integrate the work for radiation is similar to how we will integrate it for all the other systems. Uh, we have down at the, in, in the lower left some uh, countermeasures that we might develop based on our work in, uh, uh, in, at Brookhaven National Laboratory. 
Uh, over on the right on the bottom, we have the shielding work that's being done by STMD and, and by the commercial providers. Uh, in order to get there, in the, in the middle row on the left, we have environmental monitoring uh, and prediction, and a lot of this is coming from SMD probes that are going to deep space for us to understand. Crew selection and operations, those are our counterparts from space medicine. Uh, integrated radiation protection systems, those become part of my bailiwick again. How do we model what the actual exposure will be for a crew? What are the, uh, what are the countermeasures we would provide for the crew? And then at the top, uh, the way that the, uh, that the vehicle designers and the mission designers will develop the mission architecture and the systems that would pr uh, provide the protection for the crew. So I think that's all I had to say about that, and that kind of gives you an idea of the steps. What we see as, as, the, as the challenge is ahead for getting humans all the way to Mars and back safely. All right, thank you. All right, open up for questions. All right, Rose, I'll give it to you the first one. Totally dynamic arrays. Yes. Yeah. Brayton cycle. Is there any research being done anywhere like that? On the Brayton cycle, not in space. We've not gone down that path uh, lately. Uh, right now, it's you, you would only use that right if you were in a high uh, um, uh, power demand environment, really. And the, 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 where we're at today, the solar arrays that have been advanced to date are, you can get the same square footage on space station arrays. You can actually almost get the double power if you use the same square footage. So solar arrays are really advanced in technology. So there's a lot of, you know, as you know, development work left to be done in, in, on the Brayton cycle in space. So that's probably where we haven't done it. Yeah, I don't know of anything activities going on with them. Yeah. All right, another question? How much time is spent daily for an astronaut to do mitigation things for zero G exercise or whatever? So for, for exercise, uh, it's scheduled two and a half hours per day for exercise. Usually it's in two different segments, part in the morning and part in the evening. Um, and those are the primary countermeasures that they're employing that take any time. The rest of the things they do, sleep and, and whatever medications they take, are on their own time. Ben, would you please come inside? <laughs> Have a seat. <laughs> All right, anyway, question. I, I don't know anything about um, the, 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 the sample returns at this point. Somebody else might know something about. But there are a number of things that we're looking at that, um, that could actually uh, work very well. There's a, uh, there's a group at Johnson Space Center that works for the HAT team, and I think Skip's going to talk about some of this stuff uh, in the next session, uh, that have designed a, a rover that's, a, that's an enclosed rover that has suit ports. So a, a crew member uh, actually hops into a rover and, or hops into a suit and goes out and does and, and does the whatever work they're doing on the surface then come back comes back and, and hops out of the suit into the into the vehicle without ever without ever bringing the suit inside the vehicle so there's all the cleaning cycles and 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 all that stuff go away and then if you keep it at the at the right pressure and oxygen concentration then you don't have to do pre-breathe before you go and get in the suit each time so there's a, a number of advantages to that um, it, it's, it's, it's evolving and has been for six or eight years. It looks like it, it's a, it's, it could be a winner, but I'm a physiologist and not an engineer, so <laughs> I'm not the right person to make that final decision. But that's, that's one of the ways of, of trying to avoid those problems uh, in, 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 in that situation. Doug? Yeah, that's Skip. 
Skip's going to talk next next steps. So, sorry, you said what animal studies? Uh, related to exploration, to radiation. Uh, on space station, I don't know of any. Okay, Bill will have to answer that one. Uh, at Brookhaven, we're, we're, we're primarily using rodent models, um, and we're using tissue, tissue models as, as well. Um, so cells, tissues, and, uh, and the, the whole animal species are, are predominantly rodents. We have the capability to do uh, non-human primates there, but we haven't had the drive to do that at this point. Uh, on station, we're also doing work with, uh, with rodents. Uh, a lot of that work is being done by CASIS. It's commercial, but um, the space biology program is moving forward um, with stuff that's looking at um, some of the precursors to the, uh, the, the big challenges that humans have, uh, bone and muscle, cardiovascular, immune function. And jointly, we expect to do some work on looking at hypogravity. Um, it's really hard to simulate. It's impossible to simulate for any long periods of time, hypogravity in the Earth's environment. But there will be a centrifuge aboard the, uh, the ISS, a rodent centrifuge, and we'll be able to spin rodents at hypogravity levels, say uh, Mars gravity or, or lunar gravity for long periods of time and look at how well, how they adapt to that gravity and whether they have the same kind of bone loss if there's a threshold uh, effect somewhere in there. So there is work planned. Uh, we haven't yet started on, on ISS with rodents. When, when would this be? Um, this, the, the planning would probably be um, late in this decade uh, or, or early in the next decade. Anything from this side of the room? Harley? something of a breakthrough in thinking about how initial communications to Mars might go as much deeper, more focused. So the question, my first question then would be, um, what would be your surmise about if the experiments on the space station that uh, really, really need to be repeated over roughly the next 10 years? Question number, question number one. Number two is um, you, you left a, a, a project Oh, the big fire. <laughs> Hear the pyro in the crowd. Uh, okay. First of all, the high-priority um, demonstrations on ISS, we went through an exercise where we looked at different Mars mission scenarios, and we... Am I on? Hello. And we bounced uh, all of our kind of wish list off of those and, and, and did a prioritization exercise. Probably our highest priority items would be those related to habitation, uh, so life support systems, environmental monitoring, fire safety, um, those are exercise equipment. We definitely want to get those to station sooner rather than later and, and use station to prove those out uh, for as long as possible. Um, the second question on the big fire. Um, it's going to be done in uh, phases. Uh, the experiment is called Sapphire. And our friends at Glenn Research Center uh, are working that. Um, they're looking at different materials. Uh, they're going to ignite and uh, do different studies of what happens with the big fire uh, over about three missions. And then in the second series of missions, we're hoping to incorporate a combustion product uh, analyzer, um, see how we can detect the fire. Uh, suppress the fire and then clean up the fire. So we're hoping to kind of incorporate the whole life cycle of a, of a big fire into this test series, but it's called Sapphire. More questions. I, ha I have one for Mr. Gold. <laughs> what, what, what does Bigelow hope to get out of the, the beam experiment on station? Just say I was disappointed when Robin was asked, what's the most important thing we can do on ISS? <laughs> <laughs> it's a reason. I also have to comment, uh, non-human primates used to be the technical definition for an attorney. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
So, you know, I, I think Bigelow Aerospace, in many ways, the Genesis 1 and 2 missions were too successful, as I described before. And I think we were a little ahead of our time that Bigelow Aerospace's greatest Achilles heel subsequent to Genesis 2 in 2007 was the lack of crew transportation. That it was going to be, at this point, what, 10 years, 11 years, mm -hmm. you know, before we got the crew transportation. And that's a long gap for any company. And for those of you in the private sector, even at NASA, you, you need projects to keep the troops moving, to have quality work, and to push the technology forward. And the beam provided the perfect intermediate step for our company to have a project that would be valuable for us, valuable for NASA, valuable for the technology as a whole, yet did not necessitate commercial crew immediately. So, you know, let me say that from a substantive point of view, this was a great middle step between Genesis, which were not crewed, and B330, which is the full-on system, to demonstrate with people for the first time. That's really what the beam is about. You know, what can we do? Can we live up to our promises relative to supporting crew? Let me also say that, you know, as the attorney, I'm concerned about money, the business case is very important. And when we talk about where Bigel Aerospace will be heading for that, certainly one of the areas are foreign clientele. Uh, on one end of the spectrum, you have, uh, say, a country like Japan or JAXA or Canada that have a proud and long history of human spaceflight. Then on the other, take a country like United Arab Emirates, for example, UAE, which has never flown people before but might like to do so, particularly if they could do it in an affordable fashion. There is still no gold star like there is working with NASA. And I can tell you the credibility that will be built up by being aboard the ISS is absolutely invaluable. So we're looking to get that boost out of the BEAM program, quite frankly, uh, as well as the technology demonstration of being part of a crewed system for the first time. All right, thanks. Any more questions? Right behind Buzz. No, go ahead. Um, Yeah, it's, cer it's certainly a, con a, a concern. Oh, so the, the question had to do with, uh, with crew members who are very far away from Earth and can't see home anymore. Okay, so home just becomes a bright spot, spot off on the horizon like Mars looks like on a, uh, uh, early in the morning or, or late at night uh, when, you're, when you're stargazing. Um, so, you know, the, the, the question, it's, it's a broader question than that about homesickness, about, about what, what it takes to keep people motivated uh, during uh, long, uh, 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 quiet times. You know, we, we can gather some of that information from Antarctic winter over stations. Um, it's, it's, it's a slightly different question, but you know, when you're, when you're in, in the dark for, for six months uh, and you're far away from everybody and it's hard to get home and you can't see anything except the, the sky, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit of a challenge. So we use analogs of that sort, um, but you know, we probably won't know for a lot of these, uh, these dragons, we won't know until we've actually done it. You know, what, you know, my job is really to try and reduce the, the, the probability that anything sitting out there is gonna, is gonna harm us. Um, and whether something is out there or not, we won't know until probably we go. The longer we can do simulations on station or in, in cislunar orbit, uh, the longer, at least for some systems, we can debunk some of that and make sure that we're, we're going to be safe in sending people. Maybe we could bring pets. We can bring pets. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Well, it's not nearly as nice as one of Mr. Bigelow's fine hotels and apartments. <laughs> you can't be beat. Um, is there, a uh, no. there is no window in the beam. We actually did have windows in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, however, because it isn't technology that we wanted. Uh, however, with NASA and being part of a crude system for the first time, we decided to be as conservative as possible with the beam. 
What you will see inside, and to be clear, the beam is primarily a technology demonstration. That This is not necessarily about what you would do inside so much as it is the envelope and how it functions as part of the ISS and how it can function independently. Uh, there will be longerons that run through the center of it and crew holds. So, you know, there will be attachment points that you could potentially utilize for experiments or just to hang out. I'm told acoustically it will be the quietest location on the International Space Station. And I think when this question was posed to Gerst, and I certainly don't want to put any answers in his mouth, you know, he said, we're going to get the beam up there and then see what we may or may not do with it. If it's acoustically quietest, you know, throw a couple of sleeping bags in there and who knows what might happen. So we, exactly, we think it'll be a good experience oh, actually. After we drag the, the fan in there, yeah. then it won't be quiet anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So there is a pass-through system pass -through that keeps system, the oxygen right. flowing from the ISS to the beam. So, you know, I, I think it'll be a comfortable yeah. environment inside. Yeah. yeah. Um, I have a question for you, Michael. Um, the, you, you mentioned in your slide that there's less mass involved. Um, I don't want to step on a trade secret here, but comparing to existing ISS modules, something similar size to the Higua module, what are we talking about? Now forget trade secrets. You're going to have me do an ITAR violation. <laughs> I see foreign nationals in the room. Um, let me say that, uh, <laughs> yeah, plug ears. Tell that to Ditsa. I told him to plug their ears. Um, let me say that you know I don't want to get into an actual percentage with you, and that can vary depending upon the mission and the activity. Yeah, well, you know, what you put inside is, is, is a really big driver. Well, the amount of radiation protection, et cetera, and where the habitat is. You know, the mass savings for a module in LEO would be different than something in DRO, different than something on the surface of Mars. But, you know, let me say it's significant uh, that it is one of the aspects that would drive the benefits. Uh, however, I, I do think that the volume... I apologize for that. <laughs> That's Mr. Bigelow right there. <laughs> Let me assure the boss on my phone I'm saying nothing to this. It's significant, and you know, if you wanted to go through NASA or something, we could probably have a conversation in a quieter location about what the numbers are on that. Question over here. So in the HAT activities, uh, there's calculations, and that's all that's accounted for in the calculations as far as volume and things of that nature, how, and how much you know systems spares you need, and all those kind of things. The thing is, we haven't tried that. Okay, it, it's all theoretical, and so that's that's where we're at with, with that. So part of that you can do on the ground in simulations, but until you get it in space, like you, you know, when Skip comes up here, we're going to talk about doing a one-year mission in cislunar space, for instance. Uh, having that sort of shakedown cruise where you go prove all those things out, that all that works. As far as trash, we're actually going to fly an experiment on the space station, a, tr a trash compactor. And I don't, um, Robin, are we going to try to get water out of, out of that as well, or is this just going to be strictly uh, trash compacting? If, if the trash is wet, the water will kind of go in the atmosphere and we'll reclaim it. <coughs> so. Um, yeah, there's a, a trash compactor as well as there's a whole um, advanced exploration systems project on logistics repurposing that's looking at <coughs> repurposing cargo containers and, uh, and long duration packaging, clothing. How to reduce pack? Yeah, how do we re how make clothes last longer? So it's not just the trash, but everything yeah. having to do with logistics being looked at in that project. Back to you, Buzz. We can let you go now. <laughs> uh, having made an attempt in the past to try and enlighten NASA as to why space adaptation syndrome takes place, and it has a bit, you have some good sense of direction. Sure. 
Sure. It's pretty clear that you can make those measurements, but uh, that has not been appreciated by the medical people yet. And I was not surprised that uh, one of my latest ventures uh, in uh, pre- and post-flight for a 12-month uh, duration flight where it's very unique. I have experienced uh, yes, mood swings, okay? and that is why I'm interested in uh, veterans 22 killing themselves a day because of PTS and, uh, and other suicide uh, tendencies. My mother committed suicide before I went to the moon. I inherited things like that, and I've had some treatments and exposures to the Brain Treatment Center in Irvine. It's a relatively simple EEG with about nine mm -hmm. electrodes. Just put a cap on, and eventually uh, a couple of pounds of batteries recorded for in-flight. However, initial thing is it's a pre and a post flight. <clears throat> Talk about a lot of frequencies, a bunch of different frequencies, different locations, and uh, it ends up with a color map of the brain uh, indicating abnormal areas that can then be treated by a magnetic stimulation. The results have been very, very surprising in uh, autism, Alzheimer's, tintinitis, where a person has been hearing sounds for 20 years and, uh, and gets cured. There's a lot of efforts in PTSD. Uh, it was a simple idea that uh, a JSC medical person who was in quarantine with Neil, Mike, and I, and continued to be rather dedicated to uh, treatment uh, and observations and mental health of crew members. And he thought that the uniqueness that exhibited itself uh, warranted perhaps a little more attention to something that has recently been developed, because we probably won't have another Mm -hmm. Now, this is not a stressful flight. It is not one that involves these great distances away or even communication lag, lag which we could put into things. Uh, there are none of these uh, kind of stressful things. You know you're coming back. Uh, most people here know that I'm talking about permanence on Mars, which means you land, you do not come back. Most difficult people to bring back are the first ones that you land there. Just think of the expense and the problems involved in a Mars asset vehicle. The time it takes to do that and the cost per person on the surface. And you bring somebody back from the pioneering, we can yeah. do it about here. Yeah, uh, uh, Buzz, I mean, uh, I think that's that's now, all, that's what, part of all the challenges we're dealing what with, right? What I'm saying is that uh, the reason that further investigation was not really done by NASA, whether it's two months before uh, this, this one-year mission. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're when do you apply with your experiment mm -hmm. and how much ahead of time and then what kind of peer review do you have? Uh, we are moving in a fast developing field something that is quite useful just pre and post flight you've seen that you could spare 30 minutes of a person pre flight or post flight yeah i i, I think in a, in hrp we're addressing many of those issues that you're bringing yeah, up yeah and I, i'm aware of, yeah. of, of, of now, this uh, issue yeah 
Yeah. A, a person that's yeah. getting ready for re-entry and he's yeah. been up there a long time. Hey, Buzz, we don't have much time left, so. I know, you know, I know <laughs> uh, now, he knows when re-entry is going to take place, and, and he's been up there for a long time. Now, you go through re-entry and the G-forces, and, and you hit the ground, and somebody, they pick you up and carry you off. And, uh, and by the time you ever get to do something about the person's mental status, he's a different person. <laughs> than he was mm -hmm. six hours before re-entry and all the time uh, up there. And, and if there's a simple recording device that can also be added, I'm an optimist. And I also thought that I could probably uh, get the Russians who are more mm -hmm. interested in the mental health of their people than we seem to be because their institute is the Institute of Biomedical Problems, mm -hmm. not the curing facility. It's they look into mm -hmm. biomedical mm -hmm. problems, and they have been more concerned. Mm -hmm. uh, but I am very understanding and concerned about uh, the mental condition of people for long periods of time, uh, adjusting to what their well, that, that, that is certainly one of our high priority <laughs> items that we're, we're, we're and dealing it with. The VA too, uh, yeah, increased. yeah. Well, well, we're looking at it. There, you know, there, there, there are a number of things we're looking at for behavioral health and performance. It's a, it's a, it's a large area, uh, and, and, and this is part of it. So, um, and, you know, for this particular mission, um, the things that we chose for this mission uh, were actually selected quite before this uh, this proposal came in, and 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 the, uh, uh, the the crew time was already full. But you know we continue to look for all the new technologies that are that are being developed that might help us. And we have most technologies before we fly them in space. We test them in uh, in in analog facilities, whether they're ones that we control or the Russians control or that somebody else controls, like in Arctic winter rover stations. Uh, so we usually go through testing of that sort before we bring them forward. We are looking at there's a there's a not only in 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 brain monitoring but in in in, in physiological monitoring, fit, fitness monitoring. There's just an explosion. There's a wild west out there of new techniques that are coming forward. How many people here have a Fitbit on their wrist? How many people are doing 10,000 steps a day that their that their cell phone is is tracking for them? All these things within the next few years are going are, are gonna to be simplified and, and they're going to be fitting on your, your cell phone or maybe on your, your watch or something else. All those technologies are going to be very useful to exploration missions. Somebody mentioned food before. We're looking at how do you 3D print food, how do you 3D print medications? Because right now one of the, one of the problems we have for getting uh, 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 food back and forth to Mars is that it loses its taste. You know, you don't, it doesn't look good. Can you create interesting tasting foods by having large vats of food substrate that you can then create, you know, really good good food? Certainly, the the drugs, the stability of drugs is a is a big question. But if you can print drugs as you, as you use them and then recycle what you don't use, um, this is this this you know. So we're looking at all these technologies at the same time. The timing for this particular experiment was just not good, but we certainly there are opportunities to do it on, on you know not with a, a, an identical twin but there will be opportunities to do this again in the future. All right, I'd like to thank the panel here.